Hello everybody, welcome to the Retro Monster Truck Review. My name is Josh Rhodes. Joining me as always this week is Matt Stoltz. And we're covering part two from St. Louis in 1999, World Finals Zero. We're about a week in now, but Happy New Year, everybody. We hope you all have really had a good week here to start out your year. we got to thank you, of course, for our Apple iTunes five-star reviews, as well as those likes and follows and downloads on Spotify. And as always, thank you so much for the uh, comments on YouTube and the subscriptions over there. It really helps our channel grow, helps us get to some more eyes out there. As of this recording, I'm prepping to start my career as a tech official for Monster Jam. My first show will be in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. I'm really looking forward to it. I'm actually editing this show and then going to pack immediately right afterwards. So without further ado, I'm going to go pack and I'm going to let you guys enjoy this part two of Gravedigger Month here on the Retro Monster Truck Review. Again, St. Louis Monster Jam World Finals Zero. It's showtime! He gets into it. It's just bad. Wild. Awesome. He's cool. He's tough. He's nuts. Because we just like him. He's got a swamp in it. Anything for the crowd to scream. Grave Digger with a successful buy run and a hairpin turn. Get it here, ladies and gentlemen. Dennis Anderson is the winner. Grave Digger. The fans are the ones that drive me. You know, when you hear them cheering for you, and I just set this driving style way back when I first started, and it's a reputation I built, and I got to live up to it. Welcome one and all again to the Retro Monster Truck Review. This week, week number two from St. Louis and your United States Hot Rod Monster Jam World Finals Zero coverage. Uh, I got to tell you, Matt, this is where we're going to see the top eight do battle in here in the Monster Trucks. We're also going to see the always exciting, and you can hear the sarcasm in my voice, Quad War action. Quad Wars? There's only one thing that goes good with Quad Wars, and that is a fine Anheuser-Busch product. Yeah, because you don't want to remember them when they're done. But anyway, <laughs> uh, man, I got to tell you, too, uh, we ended last week's show. We got our top eight drivers and top eight trucks going into this. We also got to see uh, quite a bit, a little bit of a freestyle action to end our show as well. Uh, taking away from the first event that we had right there, the highlight of the first show, what was that for you as far as racing goes? As far as the racing itself, man, it had to be just some of those clean runs that we got out of Samson, out of Barefoot. Tom Mentz and Bulldozer pushing it hard, getting a little out of control, but making it stick for the win. The competition level's definitely going up here as we enter in the final points of end of the season. We're going to open the show with Dan, Mike, and Scott on the floor during round one of Quad Wars. Uh, you can kind of see the quads going on in the background. Uh, to me, that was as much Quad Wars coverage as we needed to have on this show. But anyway, <laughs> our opening is going to roll here, your classic Motor Madness intro. And then Mike's going to introduce us. Uh, Mike introduces the show with Scott as they run through the trucks that are still alive here. Samson, Mountaineer, Reptoy, Barefoot, Gunslinger, Carolina Crusher, Gravedigger, and Bulldozer are all that remain here in this bracket, starting off your final bracket of the 1999 season. Yeah, and like we said last time here on the show, TNN split this show up where round one was the first week and the balance is the second week and it kind of makes it work so they had two hours of TV to fill so that's how they chose to do it and it's a good reminder that uh, your first round race in an even bracket the rest of the bracket's going to have the same amount of races as round one minus one exactly uh, so they kind of they kind of split it out equally which is nice yeah they did they split everything out equally to recap the track right here, of course, they're going to start on a roller, then they're going to hit the cars, they're going to dive into a corner, and when they come right out of it, there's going to be a single car roller right there, a double jump, and then they've got to get back on the brakes again 
they hit the turn, the last turn, and then go over that roller that they started on, and the cars, they'll finish over. Man, six jumps in one lap. Can we get back to that, please? That'd be great, honestly. I would love to see them. I know they've got to build tracks nowadays to surround and build around the freestyle obstacles, but man, having this style of a track back for these newer drivers, I think we'd see some incredible racing. Yeah, there's nothing stopping them from putting some jumps in the racing lanes, though. I just I love the fact that these trucks are up in the air. You've got to drive the trucks through the obstacles, especially that back chute. You've got the single roller. You've got to get enough run to make that double jump. We've seen a couple trucks already in round one kind of case into the face of that landing ramp. So you make sure you got to get your throttle rhythm right through this section of the course. Exactly. Also got to get your rear steer right. Am I right, Ron Nelson? Yeah, I think you remember that from round number one where Ron clips the uh, the big hill on the other side and puts, his no- puts the uh, bust and loose machine up on its nose ends up costing him a win right there. But we're going to come back from a commercial break right here into the what's that all about segment. And that's drivers talking about their off season. And Paul Schaefer is going to be redoing some of his trucks, has a new truck coming out. Dan Patrick's going to strip down his truck and rebuild it for the outdoor season. that's getting ready to come up. Of course, Patrick's going to be part of the four wheel and off-road jamborees. Yeah, the summer season is very busy for a lot of these guys, but they get a little bit of a break here to kind of freshen things up to go outside and go on those big, long, straight outdoor tracks. Tom Mintz will be running next year, or excuse me, will be running other shows and keeping busy, looking forward to competing in a whole point series the next season. David Moore says he's going to work on his suspension a little bit because the suspension has changed so much on these trucks. Gary Porter has the best response, though, as far as I was concerned. What off season for these guys? Truck's getting tired. He's going to put a new engine in it and maybe a new body, and we'll see how it goes from there. Robbie Gray is going to take two months off to redo his truck for the next season, and man, Robbie Gray's truck doesn't even look like it needs to be touched, to be honest with you. The truck looks immaculate. I guess that's the preventive maintenance showing that it works. Uh, Robbie's truck always did look good. It was always in good shape, and he kept up on things, and it made for a good-looking piece that always was ready to go. If when he came, you know, the bell came to come to the line, Robbie's there ready to go no matter what. Of course, Scott Hartsock is going to be going out and playing with his trucks and his guns, and Brian Womack is going to take December to rebuild this truck completely. Dennis Anderson is going to freshen up some of the digger trucks, greet some fans at the shop, and be riding the ride truck and doing a lot of fishing in his brand new boat. Hey, that sounds like a good deal, going and doing some fishing in the Curatuck Sound. You catch some big fish out there. No, you certainly can. Hey, I want to go someday. Adam, Ryan, if you listen to this show, invite your boy. But anyway, round number two is going to start off here with a heavyweight matchup. Samson and Barefoot lining up here. And I got to tell you, this is two of the trucks on this circuit that have probably the most horsepower being pumped through those engines. For sure. It's up to anybody at this point to see, really, because Barefoot's always got that huge straight line speed. And Samson always seems to get the big air over the jumps as well. So it's really going to come down to the driving and how you get around these tough obstacles. Basically, these guys flip for lane choice, as we talked about in the previous episode of the show here. Uh, Womack, of course, getting the lane that he wants. He's going to be in your right lane. Your left lane is going to be Samson over there. Remember, this is the lane Womack wants. However, it's not going to be the lane he's going to desire to have the rest of this evening. Trucks leave together. Samson pulls a quick lead over the cars. Patrick, he makes a very good tight turn, but Barefoot struggles a little bit on the entry and exit. He gets a little bit out of shape. Womack annihilates a hay bale on the double. And then they switch out to the Samson truck. You can see Samson's got a good lead coming into the final turn and to the finish. Samson's going to go on to take the win here. But something I noticed while watching this back, Matt, Samson comes over that roller hill before the finish line. And as soon as it lands, the truck is, he looks like Dan's on throttle when he lands. And when he hits the last set of cars, it doesn't look like that rear is actually pulling at all. So when he hits the jump, he's got momentum from obviously exiting the corner. But it looks like the front tires pull the truck over the front, the jump. And then it noses over after the finish, like the rear just has no pull, no push whatsoever. And then there's some smoke coming out of the back of Samson as well. Yeah, you see the truck kind of, I wouldn't say limps over the set of cars the second time, but he doesn't get the big air jump that Samson's known for. He just kind of barely gets over the edge of that last car on the fly. And it's a shame because Dan has what I would call probably the best run of the night so far. Just an absolutely picture perfect run, smooth and very, very fast for Samson. And we go to the interview here with Dan right after the win, and they don't explicitly like explain that Dan is out for the night or say it but they're talking about like you know he he had the finals in his sights 
Dan says he would have been in the finals every race this season, if not for a few small issues. He loves doing what he does. He's going to take six weeks off and come out for the summer. And like, kind of like he's giving his farewell to the fans. And it does turn out that Dan's got some breakage and Mike and Scott are both kind of acting with some confusion in the booth about how it wasn't really explained fully. And they were going to try to find out the story of what broke, which I don't think we actually get during the broadcast. We just know that Samson's out and barefoot's back in. He's going to move to the semifinals on the break rule. So Womack going to get a chance to redeem himself here after a little bit of a bad run. Yeah, Womack's going to get to come back here. Uh, one thing to point out that you didn't you didn't mention is the fact that it seems like they joined Dan's interview mid conversation. Yeah, yeah, I was, found that a little very, bit interesting. It was very weird because when they cut to the interview, you could almost see Dan like if I remember correctly, he's got one hand up in the air and his mouth is still open before the mic goes back to Moriarty, and then he asks him oh, about the fine had the finals in his sights and whatever. So they, it seems like they cut the first part of Dan Patrick's interview right here, which would probably have been where he was saying, hey, we're done for the night. We broke a such and such and we're out. Uh, it almost looked like either a ring and pinion breakage or possibly a drive shaft. Maybe he, maybe he had broken right there on it because, like I said, it did not look like the rear had any pull whatsoever over the finish line. Yeah, it could be a ring and pinion drive shaft, could be an axle shaft, anything of any of those would cause the truck to have front wheel drive only. So it's unfortunate after such a beautiful run that Samson's going to be out. I think with a run like that, he's easily going to move into the finals as well and possibly even win the event if he could have kept turning the wick up a little bit each run. Exactly. And with Barefoot being inserted back in here to this event, to me, it almost virtually guarantees Barefoot a shot in the finals. And I'll get to that right now. Our next race, Mountaineer and Reptoid. These are two trucks that are not known whatsoever for pushing their equipment incredibly hard, extremely hard, or pushing it when they really need to push the equipment. And that will be the, either the winner of this race is going to be who takes on barefoot in the next round. So to me, Womack with that truck, with that horsepower, with that suspension package has an, a, a huge shot of going to the finals now. Yeah, and we see this between these two trucks as they kind of head over that cars the first time. You expect them to like almost hit the gas again to go into the into the turn because they're so far back, and they just kind of both very tepidly go into that first corner. Just the the difference in speed is tremendous between what we saw in the last race and what we see in this race. There was the race in uh, round number one that uh, we had covered on last week's show uh, between I believe it was Mountaineer and little tiger and i call, i coined it the slow and steady wins the race kind of thing because little tiger goes in and wins the wins the race or excuse me win, loses the race by via rollover by pushing it too hard here neither guy pushes it incredibly hard at all you could maybe give reptoid a bit of the advantage because he actually clears the double on one side whereas what or whereas a uh, mountaineer in the other lane kind of noses into the uh, second portion of the double and upsets suspension a little yeah. bit it's actually a good race to the line between these guys it's just it's a slow race Honestly, between them, Jim Jack's going to get the win, and it's probably because of the fact that Robbie Gray doesn't quite air over the double, whereas Jack does. He lands down downside on the double in the backstretch. We saw it in the last show from St. Louis where Robbie Gray just doesn't attack that double jump hard enough to get over it, and he smashes the front housing into oh, yeah. that jump. I mean, just a big, big rebound. It had to have hurt Robbie to some degree. They're only running a neck collar at this point, no Hans device. So had to give a heck of a hit to Robbie's neck and back. But I give him credit when he sees that he's even or maybe a little bit behind going to the finish. He does stand on it, tries to get the win, but it's just not enough at that point. Reptoid moves on to the semifinals. Now this time we're now at that, that side of the bracket obviously had a couple of heavyweights on it. One of those heavyweights is now in the semifinals with Barefoot. The other, the other side of it, not, not necessarily your heavyweights that are matching up with each other. This next side of the bracket, though, four heavyweight trucks without question. We've got Carolina Crusher and Gunslinger up next right here. Matchup of the two most consistent and smooth drivers really in the 1999 season with, uh, of course, Gunslinger taking a couple of wins. Carolina Crusher... We've talked about it on every episode that we've ever featured Carolina Crusher on on this show. Gary Porter is always smooth and consistent and knows how fast and how hard he needs to push his equipment. It's a driver that anybody would be very lucky to have at this point in any vehicle really out there, whether it's Carolina Crusher or soon to be Gravedigger a few years later for Gary. But this matchup right here is one I circled last week is to be one on paper that is just an incredible lineup or incredible two guys lining up against each other. 
For sure. I mean, it's two of the best running race trucks on the circuit. And Scott, it's something you'd never hear out of an announcer nowadays um, with how the marketing is. But Scott says there's just nothing like a Ford versus Chevy pickup truck matchup um, to a lot of these fans here tonight. Even with all the new concept trucks, a lot of fans just love that classic truck pickup look. And obviously the industry is in a very different place nowadays i'm still a fan of the the truck going out there and getting the job done but i was interesting to hear scott say that you know live Mm -hmm. it shows how much times have changed the the thing here is scott absolutely drills gary on the light and has a two truck length lead already into the first turn gary just didn't push it hard enough at the beginning of this race yeah and that's something porter didn't do this entire night he did not push the truck incredibly hard on the starting line here whereas scott hartsock he leaves him on the straightaway. He goes into the corner. Uh, Gary kind of over rotates a little bit, but I mean, at the time they come to the second turn, it's about a length lead instead of two. Gary has picked up the pace in the second portion of the track, and Hartsock has kind of kept his same pace. I would argue here, uh, Gunslinger is going to end up going on to be your winner right here. But honestly, Porter, he kind of come back on him a little bit. He over rotated the last turn though, and that's what's going to cost him the win. Gunslinger is going to move into the semifinals. But wait, there's more, folks. It appears that Gunslinger, however, is your winner, is going to have a little bit of a breakage and some problem going on right here. Hartsock uh, basically says, hey, uh, he expected more damage tonight. Excuse me, uh, Douglas says he expected more damage tonight, and now Carolina Crusher is going to be coming back into the next round. Guess you got to be able to finish and go on if you're going to be able to win the whole event. Porter mentioned earlier in the first week that that those car jumps were really steep and it was kind of bottoming out of suspension. I'm thinking that might be why he took it a little easier, especially on that first launch over the cars. Mm-hmm. The second time he kind of knew he was behind and didn't have to jump it that hard. But the first time I think he was trying to save the equipment, save his back a little bit because he took a hard shot in round one and he didn't want to – jeopardize the truck and in this case it was the right move because Hartsock goes for it i mean he doesn't completely sky the truck out but something goes loose in the mega care excuse me mega power car care products forward of gunslinger something breaks again we don't really get a good word on what breaks but bottom line is gunslinger's out crusher back in now and mm-hmm. we're gonna see who you know is gonna face that Carolina Crusher truck in the semifinals. The marquee matchup of the night so far is our last second round race. And uh, this is probably going to be, it it might be a debate between us here, but this race has been analyzed over and over and over again for a number of years between fans of both Tom Mintz and Dennis Anderson. This is Gravedigger versus Bulldozer, St. Louis, 1999. Dennis has already got the championship wrapped up at this point. However, the guy that's been the thorn in his side since midseason is Tom Menson Bulldozer, and now he's got him here in round two. This is normally a matchup you would expect in semifinal or final. Now, round number two for these guys, basically they've got to drive each other incredibly hard here, and they don't they they're used to doing this later on in the bracket against each other. It's definitely a little bit of a early treat for us fans watching yeah, here. Yeah, exactly. Seeing two of these fastest trucks, the guys that have been on top all season. On terms of TV, you know, Tom's got one TV win, but he won a bunch of other races in between those TV shows that weren't televised. So arguably the two most competitive trucks on the circuit for the season. You could throw Gunslinger up in there too because he's got two TV wins. But in terms of all-out speed and performance, I got to put Digger and Bulldozer as the top two. Yeah, I do. I got to put Dennis and Tom here on your your pedestal of the number one and two drivers, at least in this field that we have right here at this point. And I got to tell you, one heck of a race between these guys. They are dead even off the start. They are dead even in the corner. You get a little bit of a lead to Gravedigger down the back straight away, but Mintz gathers it back up. They come out of the final turn. They are absolutely dead even. And when they finally hit that last jump, Mintz's truck kind of goes off to the side on on the last jump here. Dennis is flying straight. Tom is flying at an awkward angle here. And at the side finish line angle, you can't really quite see it. But Tom's left front tire does not hit the base of the final jump. It drives up the side of the jump. It does not hit the base of the jump. And they call Tom Mintz for a five-second penalty right here. Even though Tom crosses the finish line by maybe the nose of the bulldozer ahead of Dennis Anderson's gravedigger, he's going to get DQ'd right here. Now look at this matchup. Remember, it was a blind draw. This could have been the world final match. We're going to see it here in the second round. 
Wow, Dennis Anderson, <laughs> you know you know he's got the championship, but he really wants to win here in St. Louis. He, you can see that in his eyes. He talked about the problems that he's having with his back. We certainly hope that he's feeling okay because it, it really does shake you around a little bit, especially on this course. You see the checkered flag on the back? He's got that for winning the race a week ago, but the flag used to belong to that man, Bulldozer. And Tom Mintz, and Bulldozer gets a lot of air, as he usually does, around that turn here. It's Grave Digger. They're even. They're dead even. They are dead even. We will see how they negotiate this final turn. Digger does it very, very smooth, but so does Tom Mintz. He's got some horsepower. Let's see. Oh, my. That's too close to Move ball. On. Well, not DQ. It's a time penalty, but... Um, Oh well, yeah, um, time penalty. The same we, thing at that point, though. Yeah, we we're we're talking about the the race itself here on the replay before they even say who has won the race. We see the Gravedigger replay. Dennis just barely gets the inside front tire up on that single car roller. I mean, mm -hmm. that could have been the end of it right there, perhaps, had they called a penalty on Dennis. But I, I'd say that that's a legal hit. He just got the tire up. We hear that Dennis has been declared the winner. And Which, by the way, to, Mike Hogwood doesn't put hardly any emphasis into that announcement, by the way. Just, oh, and Gravedigger's been declared the winner. Yeah, we don't really get into the controversy of it until after that statement is made. We see Moriarty down on the floor with Dennis, and there's a bit of controversy down on the floor, isn't there? Oh, yeah. Dennis is, so they had a heated discussion with Tom's dad basically saying that they were cheated out of the win, and they handed the win to Gravedigger. And if you say something like that to Dennis Anderson— He's going to let you know about it. So apparently there was a heated discussion back in the pit area about it. Uh, to me, when they show, as Dennis is talking here, he says, hey, I don't want anything handed to me, given to me, anything. I want to see the replay of it, and I want to see where the infraction was, basically, for Tom. Uh, while he's talking here, they do show the head-on replay. And to me, clear as day, Tom misses this jump. That was the most incredible race I think we've seen all season. I know it. It was in the, it was in the, in the second round. I couldn't believe it was being Tom. We kind of had a little heated discussion back here in the pit. Tom felt like they got robbed, or Tom's dad did. So they robbed him and they gave it to Gravedigger. I told him I wanted to see a replay. They said he didn't hit the cars, didn't do something right. But I don't want him to give me a darn thing, especially here in the finals. Because right now I'm kind of ticked off, but I could care less. I'm going to win the championship anyway. I don't care how bad they cry. But I daggone sure don't want to take nothing from nobody and them hand it to me. And I don't want these guys in the pits to think that. All they're doing is pointing their fingers at me right now. My temperature's up a little bit and I'm a little ticked off. Normally I don't get ticked off, but I ain't liking it right now. Yeah, I mean, if I'm the official, I'm calling the penalty as well because there's there's a multifaceted issue here in that we've got a crush car that's your obstacle. You have a dirt ramp that leads up to the crush car. But the dirt ramp has got to be at least probably, what, two feet wider than that crush car. So Tom misses the, the first crush car by a good eight, ten inches by the time he gets to the car. He kind of drives up a little bit of the ramp, but it, the way that I always read the rule, and I don't have a rule book in front of me, but the, the rule that I always understood was that you needed to hit the obstacle with the front two tires. Now – do you say how much of it is the obstacle? Is the ramp the obstacle? Are the cars the obstacle? I It's hard to say. It's a judgment call. It's a ball and a strike. I'd call a penalty here on Bulldozer if it was me. He didn't get the tire at least to the top of that ramp where it meets the car, and I think that's where my judgment call lies is at the top of that ramp where the obstacle truly starts, the cars you're jumping, Tom didn't get both front tires up over it. Tom's going to maintain in his interview here that he hit, he got air with the left side of the truck. Therefore, he hit the ramp. How do you get air with the left side of the truck without it hitting the ramp? He asked with kind of a smile and smirk on his Tom Mintz's smirk. We're all familiar with that. Uh, my reply to him would be simple. He did hit the ramp. He drove up the side of it. He did not hit the base of the jump. And to me, that's where the penalty is. The base of the jump. Hey, Josh, how do you define the base of the jump? To me, it's the bottom of the jump that is even with the ground that is in front of that jump. If Tom does not hit that line right there at the front of that jump, and he is driving up the side of it, that is where the penalty is for me. That is where I see the penalty, and he does not hit that jump. Yes, he got air with the left side, but you can still get air with the left side of the truck if you don't hit the base of the jump, and that's what happened right there. 
Yeah, and it's something that has been a controversy not only here in this event, but in a lot of other events. I can remember a Penda race in Naples where Andy Brass gets called on a DQ where one of the cars was a lot longer than the other car, than mm -hmm. the other lane. So they measured out the lane width so that the two lanes were equal. And even though Andy got up the face of the ramp and up over the car, he was still out of bounds, so they called him on a DQ. So it's kind of a, a good way to do it if you can lay down actual boundaries somewhere that have a binary yes or no answer as to whether it was legal. And this is a hint for all you RC guys out there that run events because I used to do this in the past. If you're going to have a, a ramp rule, just put a cone on either side of the ramp about three inches out. A cone's either up or it's down. That way mm -hmm. you never have to make a judgment call, and that's what they did in the Penda days. They put the stakes in the ground. If the stake is up, it's a legal run. If the stake got knocked over, it's it's an illegal run. Here, you know, obviously it's a judgment call. I think we both came to the same conclusion, maybe yeah, we via, did. Different, uh, via different explanation, but – Dennis doesn't want to be handed anything, as you said. He wants to make sure he's got his win legit because let's remember the landscape that we're talking about here. It's 1999. Dennis is less than a year away from having sold the Gravedigger operation to Pace SFX. Mm -hmm. He's now, quote unquote, the corporate giant and the golden boy that everybody thinks the race is fixed for him to win because he's the company truck. Tom is kind of a pseudo company truck that he's running a company name on his own chassis. So you could see the optics of where maybe if depending on what side you lie on that Grave Digger was quote unquote handed a win. There were some wins that Digger, I would argue, was handed this season. This is not one of them. Yeah, and I could argue the same thing. This is not one of them. Dennis wins this race outright. And he's going to move on to the next round here, much to this may have, I, I guess, he and Tom Ince's dad were the ones that had the argument and not Tom himself. But hey. Well, either way, Tom's still upset about it, too. One of the closest races we've seen all season for a quarterfinal match. Yeah, I tell you what, they're saying I didn't hit the cars with both front tires. It looked awful close to me. You know, it was a tough race. It's probably going to be the best race of the night. It's too bad we come out on the wrong end. And what do you think about that? I mean, you felt you hit both? You Could you feel them underneath your tires? I felt I do. How do you get air? If you watch a video, how do you get air on the left side of the truck if you didn't hit the ramp? And then as far as the fish is concerned, you guys were an inch apart. Yeah, I know. It looked to me like I won on the video. And it definitely looked to me like I hit him with both front tires. I didn't hit him with much on the left side. But, you know, he's a great competitor, and I lost to one of the best. We'll get them next time. The world of monster trucks has a little controversy once in a while, doesn't it? Yeah, it definitely does. Yeah, Tom's mad about it. The whole men's cap's mad about it. But the way you look at it and the way that I interpret the rule to be and the way that you interpret the rule to be, it's a penalty no matter what. Like I said, race that's been argued and talked about for a very long time. If you've never seen this race, what are you doing listening to this show? Go watch that race and then come back to finish our coverage right here. Uh, our next segment, though, after this incredibly controversial event that we have is uh, we get a collision course segment. And basically, it's Little Tiger's round one rollover from the previous week. And then we also are shown King Crunch's wheel coming off. And, of course, that classic bust and loose rollover. Yeah, a little bit of a recap from that first week where we get the crashes, we get the collision course, and I love the collision course segments in 1999 as a nine-year-old kid who didn't yet own the Crash Madness VHS, got to see a lot of those old crashes and rollovers that they would show here, and when they went to this one and it was all stuff from the previous week, I'm like, what the heck, I want to see like TNT Motorsports and old crashes, but uh, either way, it's still a good recap because you've got the King Crunch uh, tire coming off, as you said, the bust and loose roll, the little tiger roll. Not much carnage so far tonight through round number two. Pretty much everybody's got a clean run for the most part. A little bit of mechanical breakage with a couple trucks, but no big catastrophes, which is why we're getting the collision course here with all the stuff from Freestyle. Also, this is kind of like your start of uh, where St. Louis kind of got to be known as this. Stuff is going to happen here kind of an event. Here you've got three highlights from one show so far that are going to be highlighted for years to come. There's one more highlight to talk about. Before that, though, we got to go into uh, this Quad Wars stuff that we have right here, and we see the team point standings. Pretty sure we all know that this is all fabricated right here, but apparently St. Louis, shocker, the hometown team is coming into the championship weekend with the points lead 
over New Orleans. Taking uh, New Orleans has to basically win Heat one, win Heat two, and they're 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 the quote unquote champions. St. Louis has to win Heat one to secure the championship. However, it looks like St. Louis is going to lose Heat one. They're going to come back and win Heat two, and that's going to of course bring on your championship and a well choreographed pack racing here between these guys. I must add, but St. Louis is going to make a pass on the inside on the final turn, and St. Louis is going to win your quote-unquote championship for the uh, quad wars here at the end of the season. With minimal shenanigans, which is a bit odd for the era, you know, pretty much every one of these quad wars events, you've got a snafu that leads to the finish of the main event, and then you have a grudge match to settle it all. But here we just kind of have the racing, we have a finish, and that's kind of it. And then we go to Team St. Louis holding the trophy. Yeah, St. Louis gets to hold the trophy up. Congratulations to those guys on winning their their event. Uh, the illustrious like said, Quad Wars title. Yeah, I'm not a not a fan of this stuff. Everybody knows I'm not a fan of this stuff. To me, this was where I paused everything and decided I was just going to take a break for a little while from taking notes. I honestly did not even want to watch it. I've never ever cared for Quad Wars. I never understood how some this. Might be a little bit of a rant here, but hey, we've got this legitimate motorsport that we're actually having a giant race for. But here's your pro wrestling portion of the show. I, I understand having side acts, yeah. but to me, Hot Rod Bobby Cox could have filled this time more than Quad Wars. Yeah, you're you're right. And uh, to get into kind of the minutia of it, I think Quad Wars was probably mostly done kind of as a an insurance thing both literally for insurance purposes, because if it was more choreographed and slowed down, less guys are going to get hurt. Um, they're not really racing for anything. They're kind of just putting on a show, but also insurance in terms of, you know, you're going to put a good show on for the fans if it's kind of predetermined and it's not just going to be some guy running away and making for a boring show. So, I mean, I don't have to agree with it, but I get it as to why they've always done quad wars this way, the way that they've done it. Um, especially in a stadium environment like this with big jumps, you don't want some semi-pro guy out there going out, breaking his back in half and, and suing the company. But um, it's still something that I could tell when I was five years old was obviously predetermined. Yeah, I mean, when you watch the final turn that they show on TV, it's like, why in the world would, if this New Orleans guy is about to win a championship, why in the world would he leave three quad lengths on the inside open? Going to the last turn, even in 1999, I'm not I'm not even graduated high school yet, and I can watch that and go, yeah, that's never going to happen. But still, yeah. that's that's I, the way that the quad wars ends. I very much preferred when they brought the Formula USA uh, sanctioned pro quads in for a lot of these races, yeah, starting they, in like 2002, and they did it for a couple years. Those guys were it was part of a legit series, and they were racing for points and for purse, and they put on a great show still. Um, with a little bit more preparation involved, of course, for the race course, they made it work with a lot of these similar type obstacles, and I think it really worked out well for the TV coverage as well. They still were able to feature it in the O2 season, and we got guys like Tim Farr, Dana Creech, Corey Ellis that were legit quad racers, and a lot of these quad wars guys are legit quad racers too that they're just putting on a show here, but they kind of got to have their own identity as a competition motorsport side, and I was glad to see that change. Yeah, I was incredibly glad to see that change as well because this stuff to me has no need at all inside of an event like this. It, it delegitimizes the rest of, a, of the event from a competition standpoint, in my opinion. You know, yeah, mine as well. In the fact that it's being presented as a competition and not a show. If it was being presented as what it really is to a degree, uh, you know, I could give it a little bit more of a pass, but it, it always made me wonder would people would so many people think that monster jam monster truck racing was fixed if we didn't have quad wars yeah i would i would say probably not yeah i would say the same thing uh we're gonna go into our semifinals here and man what a shock grave digger and carolina crusher the two north carolina boys we talked about them racing each other quite a bit on this show and ever almost a lot of these episodes have featured a Carolina Crusher Gravedigger matchup at some point coming out. And here, this might be one of the last times that you get to see Dennis Anderson versus Gary Porter in the two trucks that they built and started and grew over the years. That's a good point. I never really thought of that. This is pretty much the last time because, at least on TV, because Gary's going to go on another year and a half later to drive a Gravedigger truck for pretty much 
the lion's share of the remainder of his career. So a Grave Digger Carolina Crusher matchup, something we've seen so many times, even here on the Retro Monster Truck Review. This is one of the last, if not the last one on television. Yeah, and we've got, like we said, Dennis and Gary, two guys, they never back down from each other. Even though Porter seems like he is kind of backing off a bit at the start of these races, it makes me wonder if Gary doesn't maybe have quite the tall enough gear in it to pull some of the big, the long straightaway shot going into the first corner. I think he's got enough gear for the backstretch and the turn. I just don't think he's got enough for that that portion of the track that's just a long stretch right to the turn. And it shows right here off the start here as Dennis pulls a good start. He's ahead going into the corner. Dennis is ahead down the back straightaway. Gary's starting to catch him a little bit. But Dennis is still kind of maintaining the lead. But Dennis, just for whatever reason, he pushes it way too hard into this last turn. And man, at the time, this was one of the best saves we'd ever seen in monster trucks, really. Dennis pops it up onto two wheels. You can see the front suspension kind of cocked underneath the truck. The rear is actually going to almost flatten the rear sidewall to the ground. Dennis is going to drive out of it, avoid hitting Carolina Crusher. And by the way, that turn pole, you ever see those, uh, like, some of those memes every now and then where you see the two eyes and the mouth on an inanimate object where it like just misses <laughs> something that pole needs that meme made of it because Perfect Dennis clearance. Is, yeah. Dennis just, I mean, barely clears that starting line pole right there and uh, pulls off an incredible save. However, doesn't get the cap off his season that he's won his first championship in with a racing championship in St. Louis as Gary Porter smooth and steady wins the race. Gary Porter is going to go to your final round after Dennis is saved. Mike Hogwood, Scott Douglas, and Dan Moriarty down to the semifinals in Monster Truck Action. There's Carolina Crusher. And the Crusher and Gary Porter have their work cut out going against Gravedigger. And for years, these two have been old, old rivals. They know each other very, very well. Both hail from North Carolina. And it is going to be some showdown. You know, Gary Porter is here because he keeps his truck together and he is consistent. Remember, Gunslinger beat him in the quarterfinals, but Gunslinger is broke. Gary Porter able to make the call. He's done that for years. Not only is he a great racer, he keeps his equipment together. Now, though, he knows he's got to go full out to beat Grave Digger. And let's remember that Dennis Anderson has had a little problem with his back as he points that nose down over that first jump. He said, you know, that's a problem. It almost knocks the wind out of it. So we'll see what happens and how it affects him as now they come around and take this final turn. Digger, oh, my, Grave Digger. Oh, oh, oh. What a piece Christian. of driving. What an incredible save that was, Mike. Crusher's going to win. Digger oh. could not get around that turn, but really did a great job of saving this truck from going over. You really see the talent of one Dennis Anderson when you watch after this straightaway, making that final turn. I don't, see, I don't see how he kept it from going. And it also shows you how focused he is because, you remember, he's been very upset after what happened to the controversy after the bulldozer thing. To make that move, that was an amazing drive. Wow. Yeah, he just pushed it a little too hard. The rear end bites, and I think in the previous round, Dennis throws it into the corner very similar, but I don't think he got on the front steering quite as hard, and I think that's the difference between these two laps here. The truck rocks up. You mentioned the front end tucks under, which makes it for a good save because it, the truck really gets gyrated out of shape. And this is the kind of stuff that Ryan Anderson now does on purpose exactly. every week. If you could see how much our industry here has progressed, this is Dennis just trying to keep the truck from rolling over. And now his son is doing this kind of stuff on purpose, balancing it like a true artist and kudos to Dennis for both saving the truck and not for driving into Gary because they're the two ended up pretty close there coming yeah, out of that did. last corner. There's probably only well, less than 10 feet between them. That's cutting it a little close for comfort. Yeah, and Dennis's rear tire lands. Porter's still exiting the corner. So it's, they're pretty yeah. close to each other right here. Uh, like I said, Ryan does this on a weekly basis here. This is something that is just incredible, and you can almost hear the I – mean, I know they've got the crowd audio turned down for this, but you can almost still, still hear the gasp of the crowd as Dennis pops up on the two wheels right here. Like I said, though, he loses the race. But he says, hey, if I'm going to lose, I'm going to lose to a fellow Carolinian like Gary Porter. He says, a lot of trucks are from around here, Barefoot, Monster Trail, Bulldozer. And then he mentions the forbidden one, Bigfoot, is not here tonight. Uh, it's cool to hear Dennis say that. He did say that over the years. If you were at a live event every now and then, Dennis would, hey, Dennis, which trucks did you remember racing uh, back in the day that you wish were here? And one of the first ones usually we always out of his mouth was Bigfoot. Dennis don't care. He's going to tell it like it is. And he, he loves Bigfoot, loved racing against Bigfoot. And uh, we're here in St. Louis. He's mentioned all the people that are from around here. 
and Bigfoot is from around here. And even if you look at the optics of the time, you know, we're only less than a year from Bigfoot participating in Monster Jam events. So there's still a lot of hope for a lot of us at this point that that kind of know what's going on in the industry. Mm -hmm. The Monsters Monthly columns, you go back and you read those emails that are, you know, Bigfoot Monster Jam, how come they can't come to an agreement? And and it's unfortunate that that has stuck now for 23 years where we haven't had Bigfoot in a Monster Jam event, you know, of course, save the, the Ford Centennial celebration. So it's a real bummer. Um, hopefully someday it'll happen, but uh, the, the cards are on the table for so many years that I don't have a whole lot of hope at this point. Yeah, keep your fingers crossed. And one thing I've always learned in my life is you just never say never to anything in the entertainment industry or racing industry. Never say never to it. Uh, as we move on here, we're going to see Gary Porter talk about how, hey, he's got a lucky horseshoe somewhere. Or he's got a lucky rabbit's foot somewhere with him tonight because now he's able to take advantage of losing a race on breakage, getting to come back, and now taking advantage of Dennis Obviously, having the better run of the two up until the point that he has the save, that he takes advantage of Dennis's mistake. Now he's in the final round, and in our other semifinal, we've got another guy that's taken advantage of a mistake. That's Brian Womack and Barefoot taking on the Reptoid Machine. And honestly, I'm probably just like everybody else watching this broadcast, wondering how Reptoid got this far in the bracket. Well, Reptoid has earned his spot. He's won the races so far, and and Barefoot hasn't. So. You could look at it from that viewpoint that Reptoid really deserves to be in this round. He may have had a little bit easier path in terms of the trucks he was against, but he won his races. He's in this this round. Uh, barefoot. I'm not. By the way, I'm not taking anything away from Jim Jack and Reptoid. I know he campaigned this oh, truck he's smooth, for a number know? of years. He's a smooth driver. He did win Monster Jam televised events on uh, some wet courses in Florida. Mm -hmm. He had the TV praise. I'm not knocking him at all. Yeah. I'm just saying on this night against this field, Jim Jack in the semifinals, it's no way. Never would, a, never would have thought it. Yeah, it's a lot of competition. You know, we've got uh, in round one, he was against King Crunch. Uh, arguably what would have been the, the biggest order of him at, to that point of the night. And King Crunch had the mistake, blows the left front tire off of it to boot. And... Jim Jack moves on with a smooth run. Second round, Jim Jack moves on with a smooth run over the Mountaineer. So he's just one of those guys that he's going to run his race. We've talked about it here before, hoping you make the mistake. And mm -hmm. this time he's up against Barefoot, who's trying to redeem himself from a mistake in the previous round when he lost. So Brian Womack's definitely going to try to punch in a much smoother run this time. Speaking of smoother runs, one thing to note, Womack really let, really said earlier in the uh, the first episode of the St. Louis show, he really liked the right lane that he was in in round number one. Well, he made a mistake in round two in that lane. Now he's forced over to the left side of the track. And I think that's exactly where he needed to be the entire night because Womack puts down a really, really quick run right here, a very smooth run as well. And he takes one of the widest margins of victory of the night, really. He does for sure. It's probably what a five, six truck length victory to where they had to really zoom out to make sure both trucks were in the camera shot here at the end. Barefoot looking really, really good here in this semifinal run. And Brian Womack going to go up in the finals against Gary Porter and the Carolina Crusher, two guys that are on their second life of the night. Yeah, exactly. Two guys that got the second. They got they basically got the free pass, if you will, like the NASCAR awards, the lap down cars, a free pass every now and then. These two are your lucky dogs on the evening and right now. Let's not um, forget Jim Jack. Actually, I mean, if you watch his run on the ISO cam, it's not a necessarily bad run. He has a smooth run like he always does. Womack just put in a really, really good number here. That nice, tight first turn. He made up a bunch of time there. And then, of course, on the straightaways, nobody's going to beat the barefoot Hemi. Yeah, no, no one's going to beat Barefoot on this track, on that straightaway, down that track, over the double going into that corner. Um, uh, basically, to put an extent here as to how wide the margin of victory was, Barefoot's crossing the finish line as Reptoid is coming out of the last turn and the front tires are hitting the roller hill. So Barefoot just had an incredible lap. And honestly, if they were timing laps, I would consider this to be the fastest pass of the night. 
this pass or maybe the run from Dan Patrick, that both in that lane, both very nice tight turns. I did not break out my official uh, stopwatch for this event, unfortunately. So we'll have to let the viewers at home kind of do that on their own. We'll we'll have them put it in the comments. Who had the yeah, faster hey, run? Who had a faster run here, Dan Patrick or Brian Womack? Speaking of our final round right here, we've got two trucks that have been in this industry for a number of years. Obviously, the Barefoot Machine made its name early as a Chevrolet. Now, of course, it's a Dodgeback Machine. Carolina Crusher right here. Gary Porter behind the wheel. I think everybody, if you're walking into this event and you're looking down onto the field, you could say Gary Porter is going to go deep in the bracket. If you look at this event uh, from a, a fan standpoint, a typical fan standpoint, you look at Barefoot, you remember the name Barefoot, you remember the name winning a lot of events, you expect the name Barefoot to go far. Maybe not so many people expecting Brian Womack himself that are kind of the insider fans to go this far and be into the final round. But here we've got two classic trucks, two classic names, and a guy that's arguably looking for the biggest win of his career with Brian Womack and Barefoot taking on Gary Porter, the most consistent truck all season, really, in the Carolina Crusher Chevrolet. It's a dynamite final on paper because, as you mentioned, two of the legendary names in the sport, they meet in the finals. Both have a round two loss. Scott mentions this on the broadcast. and mm -hmm. But we're going for the event win here. Barefoot going to get the, the jump here on this first straightaway. And we kind of go to that ISO cam again where we see that Barefoot in that far lane pulls a strong second leg out of three on this course. Oh, yeah. He pulls a very strong second leg. He also pulled a strong first leg. Porter, again, off the starting line, not quite up to snuff as he was in the previous round, really, as well. He's, he's not pushing the truck through the first quarter of this no. track very hard at all, whereas Womack pushes it off the starting line, pushes it over the cars, pushes it into the corner, pushes it out of the first turn. And I think that's what makes the difference right here. When we come to the final turn, Womack's going to end up with the win right here by basically getting to the throttle quicker than Gary Porter. Porter had a strong second half, a very strong second half to gain back some of the advantage that he lost to Womack here. It just wasn't enough. And you're not going to beat barefoot on a straightaway coming to a set of cars. It's just, it's, I mean, there's maybe one or two trucks out there that could at this point. Carolina Crusher's not one of them. It's a fitting final and a good race overall. Yes, a lot a of back race. and forth because you get barefoot with the early lead. Crusher pulls back a good bit. I think the difference here really is that Gary just didn't push hard enough in the first portion of the track all night. And that's what cost him the win in round number two. It's what costs him the win here as well, I feel, because if it's he what really... would have, if Dennis had not had the save that he had and created the fourth big highlight from this show, mm -hmm. it's Dennis Anderson in the final, yeah. not Gary Porter. And who knows how that was going to go either. So I, Womack puts in a really, really good run here. Uh, again, this truck known for its big power but not necessarily performance on turning courses the barefoot team always struggled in the turns because the way that their suspension was tuned they're running the zf axles that are a little bit narrower than a lot of the other folks the trucks like to rock up on two wheels the suspension likes to unload the truck sits real high it has a high ride height but Womack just gets the job done here in St. Louis. Maybe it's the hometown rub he's getting from the local fans. The pressure's on. Maybe he just thrives under pressure that well. But Barefoot with a strong final run. I don't know if you could have driven that truck any faster than Brian did on that run. Yeah, I don't think that you really could. This run, his semifinal run, picture perfect. Like I said earlier, I think he should have stayed in that lane the entire night. That left lane, obviously, even at this point, I would say having the left turn into a corner is a big advantage for these drivers at this point, right? Uh, I believe Womack sitting in the center of the truck. Yep. But it may be a comfort thing with mm -hmm. turning that turning that left first here. Us so, Americans, we like making the left-hand turn in a racing environment. Exactly. I watch NASCAR. I agree with that 100%. Uh, to note here at the end of this season, Dennis Anderson is your points champion. Barefoot wins your final event. It also won your first event in Houston with, I believe, Todd Frolic behind the wheel, defeating a Gravedigger truck in the final. Yep. Uh, right here, though, We've got Barefoot winning this event, and Matt, 2021 St. Louis Monster Jam. This event, one of them that I attended 22 years after winning this event, Brian Womack and Barefoot were mentioned and recognized as winners as World Final from World Final Zero in this building. They also mentioned the fact that Jim Kohler in Avenger was there 20 some odd, 22 years ago as well at that event. They talked about this in great detail at the event that I attended before the trucks actually got started rolling. And I really love the fact that they brought that up 
Yes, it's a hometown crowd. They're talking yes. about Barefoot. They're talking about Brian Womack. They're mentioning him on the live thing. 22 years after winning it, he's still getting talked about in 2021 from winning this event. It's great to hear that they're taking a look at this history a little bit more nowadays, especially with the creation of the Monster Jam Hall of Fame. It seems yeah. like the folks at Feld are kind of starting to take a another look at this older history in the Monster Jam brand that goes, you know, all the way back to 1992 that they acknowledge as the Monster Jam brand, which is true. The first Monster Jam, October 17th, 1992 in the Pontiac Silverdome. So those earlier years, the what we call the pre-Vegas era, mm -hmm. I'd love to see the folks at Feld and Monster Jam start showing the fans out there a little bit more of this stuff because it's important to know where you come from. It helps to build the story for the fans in the stands and, and give you a better entertainment product as well. We see other entertainment venues like NASCAR. They call upon their history a ton to show the fans where they came from, why these stories that we're talking about now matter and they relate them to what's happening on the track today. Uh, you hate to make the relation to wrestling, but the WWE Network it became the juggernaut that it was because of all the old footage that they put on there. So exactly. uh, Andrew Palachko, anybody at Monster Jam, if you're listening to this show, we love the old stuff, of course, given by the name of our podcast. But a lot of the other fans, when I'm at shows, I if they show something old, I try to watch the fans that are there and kind of see how they react. A lot of them seem really interested in this stuff I when agree. it does pop up. And it's not just me trying to give you my biased view of it because I want more of it. A lot of the folks really do like this stuff, and I understand there's an effort to bring that to the forefront, but it's worth it in my opinion. Yeah, I agree with you. Everything you said right there is perfect. Uh, one thing that – and this is just a suggestion. I mean they have it on their YouTube channel a lot. They, they have the, the paid subscription where you can go back and you can watch a lot of this stuff, and that is great. I am all for that. They've got from 2000 on that you can watch on their paid subscription service on the Monster Jam website or the Monster Jam YouTube page. And I love that. I love the fact that we can go back and watch those. But one thing that I noticed NASCAR doing that a lot of other companies aren't really doing as far as sporting events goes is their YouTube channel will go live every now and then or their Facebook channel will go live every now and then. And the broadcast an old race from 2000, yeah. 2001, 2002. Mm -hmm. Do that every now and then with some of these events. Broadcast the racing in freestyle. Say, uh, just randomly pick a, an event from, I don't know, 2000 on and just start bro randomly broadcasting it in there. I see I see their, t their uh, YouTube channel every now and then going live for about 24 hours with some current stuff. I love that, too. Don't get me wrong. That's great. But, hey, why not have an old school night? on the youtube channel every now and then and it, put up some of this older stuff like what we cover here on this show it's a valid thing and i'll tell you we're recording this here right before christmas i can allude to something similar i i'm a fan of the motor week television program where they yes. do car reviews and consumer advice and such it's it's an old show they've been doing it since 1980 every major holiday weekend motor week does a whole weekend marathon of old shows on youtube live they just mm -hmm. string them end to end and i watch it all weekend i put it on and when i'm doing work around the house if i'm working in the garage i have it on my tv in the garage and i'm working on my rc stuff i'm watching it as well it's worth doing they get hundreds and hundreds of people tuning in for the live feed um just you know at various points throughout the weekend it maintains multiple hundreds of live viewers at any point They've got sponsors that they have that help provide this live feed to the people. They also, of course, are soliciting donations because it's a PBS show that relies on donations from the public. So they use it as a good revenue generator. It's free to watch with sponsor help. Monster Jam, you guys could do something very similar with a lot of your partners that you have, your new fuel sponsor that you've got on board. Maybe a good opportunity to get them involved. BKT exactly. Tires, anybody out there, you've already got those relationships established give those sponsors maybe a little bit more exposure to some of the people that maybe aren't necessarily able to go to your live shows or maybe that want to see some of this old stuff it, it may reach a different audience in another sector that you're not currently penetrating yeah i agree with you uh one of the things that we got to wrap this show up here we're going to talk about is after the commercial break after the final round is all over with we get an interview with dennis anderson who has crowned your series champion and uh, it's one of my favorite quotes from Dennis. He's like, yeah, we won the championship. We got the trophy, everything here. But that ain't all we get. We got some money back there, too. And he's got this big smile on his face as he says it. And he's kind of nodding his head. So, hey, 
Congrats to Dennis. He gets his first championship right here. He thanks Josh Garcia, and he thanks Cliff Thomas, who, if I remember correctly, Matt, was the guy that took about a, a pretty good wild ride a year later in Orlando. You may want to check our Retro Monster Truck Review archives for information on that incident. Yeah, go uh, go listen to the Orlando 2000 episode if you want to hear about that. But uh, Dan asks what motivated to keep him going every week, and Dennis says what he's always said, and that it's his fans and the point series. He's interested in the point series, and his fans keep him going. Dennis says nothing is fixed. He's here to win. I feel he throws that in there due to the controversy earlier in the night. He says he's stronger and better than ever. But in reality, though, we know what's going to happen in 2000. Dennis is going to step out of digger number 12, which to me, even as a kid at the time, was kind of shocking because he just won a points championship in it. And the old adage to me has always been, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. If you're winning in 12, why hop back into 7? However, well, Digger 7 is one of my favorite trucks. It's one of Dennis's favorite trucks. There's a reason that it's still on the property to this day, and he never mm-hmm. got, never cut it up. We'll put it that way. It's sitting out in front of the property to this day in an iconic-looking Gravedigger pose. But in 2000, Anderson's going to have probably one of the most frustrating seasons he's ever had. And I think the reason why he decides to revamp 7 and go with it is because now freestyle counts for something. Mm-hmm. I think Dennis sees this as his path to be able to be competitive on both fronts because Dennis has has said in multiple different times that 12 was a very difficult truck to make look spectacular in freestyle. He really had to push the truck hard and hit stuff super hard in order to get the truck any kind of out of shape because it was just so stable. It was built to go racing on the Penda series. He never really got a chance to do that. Mm -hmm. So he built it as a race truck. Now, all of a sudden, we're going to switch up the program to our racing and freestyle are kind of equal. Dennis always ran fairly well with seven in racing, won a lot of races. So I think he thought it was his best chance to be successful in this new format. And, of course, the mechanical problems aside, the truck just really wasn't the right piece for the job. I think 14, when it would come out in 2001, was a much better balance overall. Yeah, 14 was a much better balance when they rebuilt 7 right here. I mean, if you go back and you look at classic Gravedigger number 7, to me the truck always looked a little bit wider, and obviously it was a little bit shorter, but that little bit wider stance that the truck had, along with the coilover shocks that it, it had, really ha- it sat shorter. It was a little bit more stable. When they go start to rearrange that, put different axles on it, narrow that wheelbase up on 7 a little bit, take away the coilovers, throw on, the, I believe it was the comb shocks that they threw on that truck. It just did not work with that chassis. There was a lot of breakage with that truck later on in that season. Uh, Dennis eventually gets hurt again, and they have to bring in Pablo Huffaker, substitute for a couple of weeks on shows that Dennis was booked on for television shows. And then Dennis eventually, the season ends on a high note for him and Digger number seven. Digger seven, obviously the first grave digger to win a freestyle championship in Monster Jam. But that whole year has to lead up to that one victory for him. Yeah, it's pretty much the only high point in his entire season, you know, in 2000, because from the very start in Atlanta, the truck just has nothing but problems. He wins freestyle, and that's about the only. I, half- I, take, I, I take that back. Two big highlights. Yeah. That Atlanta he, he, freestyle is one of my favorites. He wins freestyle in Atlanta with a bunch of power wheelies, and then everything between there and Vegas is pretty much a complete disaster for Dennis. He hurts his back again. He aggravates the injury. He has nothing but mechanical problems at every single event, and you could tell he's frustrated with the crew that he's got because Cliff is out doing other stuff, I think, for a good portion of the season, and then Cliff kind of rejoins him mid-season, and at that point, it's when Dennis kind of Reaggravates the back injury. So then we have Chucky fill in in Orlando again, still mechanical problems, and they kind of throw the kitchen sink at it and say, you know what, we're going to put seven on some of the smaller arenas. Joe Payne actually drove Digger seven at an event. I can't remember where. I was looking through some old results where Joe drove number seven at one of the smaller arenas while Pablo was on the TV shows. So they kind of took a step back, say, let's put Pablo in the TV shows. He's the number two driver at that point for Grave Digger. He did it justice on TV, still didn't grab any wins, unfortunately, but he but was able had, to be a little more competitive. To, he was able to put the Grave Digger name kind of still in the, in the discussion, basically. Yes. He has a fantastic freestyle. Uh, I want to say, was it Jacksonville? Jacksonville, yeah. Has he that does fantastic a good job freestyle there. Does a great job in Pontiac with Digger number 10. Some of the, honestly, some of the be- times you really only get to see Digger 10 on television, too, by the way, are those events. Uh, Pablo puts on a great show there at those two events. I remember at Anaheim, 
I think it was Lyle, Lyle. Hancock got put out the call actually, behind yeah. the wheel of number seven and put on a fantastic freestyle. Truck just did not handle in racing, though. Seven in 2000, bad experiment. But it ends up with a world championship for him at the end of the season in that freestyle. But like I said, a, a, a mistake that they didn't need to make, basically. they could If it ain't broke, don't fix it. The adage I started this whole conversation with about Digger 7, they should have stayed with 12. I think Dennis regrets not staying with 12. Obviously, still revamp seven, throw it in small arenas. That truck in small arenas built that way was fantastic. Oh, fantastic. I loved watching that truck in small arenas when I was uh, able to go to some of them to see that truck in action before it and eventually got retired. But here in the big stadiums, the big domes, 132-inch wheelbase truck, just not going to cut it out anymore. Especially with that stance. And that truck was built for coilovers with the suspension geometry it had. When you put the softer gas shocks on it, the, the front to rear weight transfer was just too much for the chassis to handle. And it was great for wheelies, uh, even in racing, um, but a little bit too much in some cases. So it was it really stressed out the driveline components a lot, too. So Digger 7, as we said, maybe not the best idea for 2000, but... You live and die by your decisions, and uh, thankfully Dennis was able to recover, get himself back up on the horse for 2001 with a new Digger 14. By midseason, they got it figured out, and he starts taking wins again. So uh, we'll transition here into the Maylocks minute in this St. Louis show as we kind of wrap things up. It's, again, that little tiger roll from the previous week. Again, no real carnage here. I find it interesting that they didn't use Grave Digger's rollover in freestyle, uh, from St. Louis. They don't really mm -hmm. show that. I think they might show it at the very end of the TV broadcast in the jam, but they should have used that for the Maalox minute, I think, since it was from this week's action. They could have used that, or they could have went to Dennis's save that he had in the semifinals. I think that's the highlight that gets played the most from Gravedigger at this event, is that yeah. save that he had over there. They could have used that, but here they used the same uh, same highlight they also used earlier on in the show for another sponsored segment, which I believe was Collision Course. Yeah, so, I mean, we're getting a lot of that in one show. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Brian Barber got a lot of TV exposure on the second week when he didn't even race. That's right. So we see the, the final shot here of the season. Um, Scott and Mike finish out with Dan on the floor. Scott mentions the, the barefoot wins that bookend the season here in Houston and St. Louis. Uh, Moriarty says the people will never stop coming as long as the drivers put the pedal to the metal. That has rung true. So a very prophetic statement there from Dan Moriarty. Sad to see that it's the last show of the season. Scott says everybody's looking forward to 2000, though, in the new century, also the new millennium for those that count at home. Mm -hmm. And uh, Mike kind of closes it out on behalf of everybody. We go to the jam with some freestyle action. Yeah, with Bulldozer, Gravedigger, Carolina Crusher, Moss Patrol, and Barefoot freestyle action. Uh, and I got, some dancing. I, yeah, some dancing thrown in there as well. But uh, damn, we don't need to cover. We don't need to cover that. We're not dance critics. We're not the. We're not a. What is it? The, the America's Got Talent or whatever. <laughs> but uh, like I said, these trucks right here that are mentioned and shown at the last portion of the show is really the last time you see some of these trucks on a national broadcast level. Barefoot, Carolina Crusher, Moss Patrol. They're all going to go to the side here. Bulldozer is going to be mentioned at the forefront at the beginning of the 2000 season with Tom behind the wheel, that classic red bulldozer logo on the side with the red wheel covers. That's going to get brought up in the first couple of events from 2000. But then it's going to transition, and all of Monster Jam is going to change in Atlanta when the debut of the Goldberg truck hits. Yep. Why is this significant, this pro wrestling truck that debuts in Atlanta later in the 2000 season? Because from that event on is when Monster Jam starts to pick up a ton of momentum. And you can, you can, you, I might get chastised for this what for it, but WCW at that time is a big product. It they are, is. And, and what's interesting is the WCW, that's when they had really topped out and were kind of on the way down. But Monster Trucks and Monster Jam get the rub from WCW, and it makes a huge difference on that side of the relationship. That it does. This is what eventually leads to the world finals being broadcast on pay per view because, hey, Goldberg trucks on here. Maybe some people that are watching from uh, the wrestling side are interested to see what the Goldberg truck does at the World Finals against the Sting truck or some of these other trucks. And then all of a sudden they're introduced to a completely different thing. And this this monster truck show that they've probably they may have heard of, but now they're watching a full event because they're tuning into this pay per view that eventually gets broadcasted. And that of course is World Finals one from Las Vegas. And uh, I got to say. This show, like we said, it kind of an end of an era and the beginning of a new era for Monster Jam. It's very much a transition, and as we mentioned earlier, it's something that we wish, uh, if anybody's listening, that, that they would show a little bit more of because 
life didn't start in the year 2000 necessarily for Monster Jam or Monster exactly. Truck. There's a lot of important stuff that got them to that point. Um, you know, Vegas is a very important event here starting in 2000, but they still had all this TV contract and everything from before that kind of set the stage for the growth of Monster Jam heading into the year 2000. In 99, we started seeing the first Hot Wheels trucks being produced for the 143rd scale line. They hit toy stores first. I remember going to my mall in the fall of 1999, and we saw the, the Hot Wheels Monster Jam rev treads, and I got a Grave Digger the first day I saw it, and I still have that truck to this day. And then the, the 164 scale die cast came shortly after at the beginning of 2000. So I it was a big change. Within a couple years, we had a huge market penetration of Monster Jam on a pop culture level, in a retail store level. I've got you know, all the school supplies and all the contracts that they negotiated for all these different products. The merchandise went through the roof. They really, really were able to capitalize on this TNN relationship and drive people to the stadiums. Crowds were going up. They were selling out big venues. TV's doing great. It really rode away for a couple of years here for Monster Jam where they really had their biggest expansion yet. Speaking of growth, this episode – is the episode that airs directly after the Nashville episode. If you go back and you listen, like we had said in the uh, previous episode for the first St. Louis racing and round number one that we covered on last week's show, we cover the rest of it this week. But if you go back and listen to the Nashville show, you can hear almost how irritated I am throughout that whole show because it seems like they're, they're not doing anything that's really worth talking about all that much. They miss a few penalties in that uh, that event. Like I said, just go back and listen to it. You can hear my thoughts on that whole show. This event is the next one that gets aired, the next two weeks for Monster Jam. And it's a 1,000% turnaround from that Nashville episode. On all the mistakes it seems like they make on that episode, they correct them tenfold here. Both of these episodes, Matt, feel like professional racing broadcast episodes, and they did a fantastic job of it. I rated this whole whole circle, all two hours that we cover here, from this event that they cover, I rated it an 8 out of 10. I thought it was a very well done produced piece mm-hmm. of, of a of television show and very well deserved to be put on the air. I agree. I, I have this at an 8.5 out of 10. It's a fantastic show, well produced. They keep things moving as well as they can given that they've got to fill two hours of TV time. I think the perfect balance would have been probably about an hour and a half. TV broadcast for this, maybe cut out the quad wars and and maybe a couple of the interviews that they kind of stretch out a little bit throughout this. But overall, very well done. One of my favorite shows from the 99 season. We've got a lot of things happening. We've got a great course that adds a lot to it. A lot of good racing that we have a few very close finishes and um a few wild a couple, rides. Yeah, a few wild rides. Some of the races aren't super close, but a lot of them are down to a truck length or two. So, uh, again, 8.5 out of 10. I'm very excited about watching this video every time it comes up. Yeah, I am as well. I absolutely love the St. Louis, these two St. Louis shows. I think that they're great pieces to go back and watch. And like we said, if you want to go watch them, they're on YouTube. Just type in St. Louis Monster Trucks 1999. You'll eventually find this episode in uh, the recommended videos that pop up from your search. And uh, I'm, I'll go back and watch it. It's a fun it's a fun watch. Well, the real ones will be watching along with us as we do our analysis. So if you've missed out on that, make sure you join in every week and watch the shows that we're doing as we uh, are talking about them. That way you can kind of follow along and enjoy right along with us. Exactly. And don't forget, next week on this show, man, I cannot wait for this one. We've built it. We've built it. We've built it. Monster Trucks 2000. Again next week. The new Thrillinium? We were talking about the wrestling connection. There's a little bit of things that we could tie into that one as well. Who knows what's going to happen down in Florida? Until then, though, guys, we thank you for joining us here on the Retro Monster Truck Review, and we will see you guys again on the tracks across America. Well, the board behind you doesn't say that you won St. Louis, but this says right here, TNN Motor Madness Monster Truck Champion. That's for 1999. That's a long season. Hey, man, it has been a long season. I'd just like to thank Pace Motorsports, the TNN, the TV crew. They've been right here with me, keeping everybody updated, all my fans, what's going on. Hey, it's been a tough season. I'd like to thank my crew guys, Josh and Cliff. Those guys, man, they've wrenched all, all winter long on this truck. 
We pulled the championship off. I didn't win here, but I didn't have to win here. I already had it wrapped up once I won that first round, and we knew we were in there. And this isn't all we get. We get some money back there somewhere, too. I guarantee that. You, but, talk, you talk about all these people that are behind you the entire way. For an entire season, though, how do you keep yourself motivated to go to every single race? Hey, it's my fans. My fans keep me motivated, and plus the point series. You know, when you put points on something, we don't care if we're just out there racing for a, a belt buckle. We're gonna, I'm out there to win regardless. It don't, it don't make any difference. We're always there to win. The races are never fixed. A lot of people will say, hey, Bob, was that race fixed? No way, Jack. If they fixed it, they didn't fix it with me riding in there. You can believe that, because I'm there to win every round, every time, if I can do it. Can you do it again next year? Are you coming back? Sure, man. I think I'll be back stronger and better than ever. We hope we are anyway. We're going to give it the best shot. You can believe that. So we'll see you again next season, brother. All right, man. Hey, I've had a heck of a time.